You're live now. Good morning. We'd like to invite you to Baker Creek Bible Church. And we do apologize for the technical difficulties of our audio. Hopefully that's running now. And we're going to actually go ahead and restart the whole service for you so you can enjoy again the songs with the worship team. So again, as we have been focusing throughout this time, we've been looking at who God is and how great he is through all the challenges that we've had. And so we're going to begin singing this morning with a familiar chorus, El Shaddai. So let's sing together, God Almighty, the one who's God most high, our Lord. Oh, no. 
Well, again, welcome this morning for those of you watching in, and we pray that that time would be encouraging for you to be able to sing through the hymns together. And as we jump into the Word of God, we're going to be back in Mark this week, Mark 7. Let's spend a couple seconds before the throne of God asking His guidance and blessing and message this morning. Father, this morning we thank you for the opportunity that we have to be able to do this at all, to be able to broadcast around be able to engage people and worship and lead them. And even with different challenges and glitches and whatnot, we know that you're in control and that you guide the process. And we pray this morning that as we go back into our series and discovering Jesus, that we would begin to see a little bit more about who you are and that we would be able to understand how you work and how you interact with people and different traditions. And a lot of times in our lives, we hold tight to things that we may not be able to or should hold on to. And we pray this morning that you would help us to evaluate those together. And again, as we pray each week, that you would help us as we listen to the word, that we would be a different people than when we started listening this morning. And we would make changes in our lives as a result. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, every community of people has traditions. From family, to organizations, to work, to schools, to gangs, to churches, to countries. And, and traditions are designed to provide structure, to create identity, and to deepen community. But you know, there's some really bizarre traditions around the world. Some of them you might have heard of, and, and, but I thought it would be fun to go through a list of a few of them. La Tamatina and... Bunyol, Spain. It's an annual food fight where everyone throws tomatoes at each other. For fun! On the last Wednesday of August. Why do they do it? I don't know, it's just what they do in that community. Then, there's cheese rolling that happens in a particular place in England. On the last Monday of the year, there's this huge double cheese wheel that's rolled down the hill, and the people go running after it, falling and chasing it. First one to get it, eats the cheese. And now, for those of you that might be turning 25 in your midst and you're still single, you know what they do to you in Denmark? On your 25th birthday, if you are still single, you will be ambushed by cinnamon all day long. They'll just throw cinnamon at you. Now, guess what happens when you turn 30, though, in Denmark and you're still single? They throw pepper at you. That's not as nice. Bolivia... In South America, it makes a plethora of pies and sweet desserts for New Year's Eve. That's their tradition. But not all cakes are normal. Some have a coin in it, and whoever finds that coin is supposed to have endless good luck in the new year. And there's another one in Italy, too. They had something to do with throwing fruit at each other, I guess, in the country or the continent of Europe. But they throw oranges at each other. Oranges at each other at a particular time in Italy. But the classic one is in Thailand. They have this tradition in Thailand where there's a buffet for monkeys. I'm not joking. So what they do is they come in and they make all this elaborate food and feed it to the monkeys. And they say, apparently, do not be surprised if a monkey is drinking out of a can of Coke. It's just normal what they do. Strange traditions. We have ours in America as well. And you know what? It's interesting. We, as families, often have strange tradition. And it's kind of one of those things that only your family does. No one else does it. It identifies you part of that family. And then I realized in thinking through the traditions of our family how many of them involve food. I don't know what that says about me, the dad of the family, but we make cinnamon rolls every Christmas. 
every Resurrection Day, Lemon Meringue Pie for Resurrection Day, Pancake Day on the night uh, before Ash Wednesday, Pie on Pie Day we make every year, Chicken Noodle Soup on Christmas Eve, Friday night is always pizza night, and we have blueberry pancakes on Saturday morning. Everything food related. But that's just what our family does. It's a tradition. And you have many of your own as well, I'm sure, that you can list off, and you're probably talking to each other right now, and say, hey, this is what we do. And traditions are great, aren't they? And they're often necessary. And they're wonderful to have to create a little bit of structure, community, and identity. But sometimes traditions can be problematic because they get so comfortable or sometimes so legalistic that they overshadow the fundamental intent of the tradition. You know, there's those people out there who die at the stake for certain traditions at work or in the family and churches, organizations. We're not going to let this go. We're, we're going to hold on to this. And I'm going to die at the stake protecting this whatever tradition it is. That's not good, or that, that's not going to be right. It's bad thing when you hold held on to the tradition that long, and it's lost its purpose. But now, how do you know when a tradition has gone past its time? How do you know when it's no longer fulfilling its purpose, and actually it could be detrimental? When does a tradition cross the line? And so as we return to our series here in Mark 7, we're actually going to talk on that a little bit, because the religious leaders come back into the picture. They've been kind of absent for a while in the last few chapters of Jesus' ministry, but they come back here, and it's with regard to a tradition that the disciples of Jesus are not keeping. And Jesus' response to that will give us clues as to how we need to evaluate our tradition. So that's the title this morning, Tradition Evaluation. And we'll start with Mark 7, with the tradition violation. Tradition violation. So if you have your Bibles with you, which I hope you do, and sorry I don't get to hear all the pages turn this morning, but Mark 7, 1 through 5 is where we're going to begin. Mark 7, verse 1. Now when the Pharisees gathered to him, him being Jesus, with some of the scribes who had come from Jerusalem, they saw that some of his disciples ate with hands that were defiled, that is, unwashed. And for the Pharisees and all the Jews do not eat unless they wash their hands properly, according to the tradition of the elders. And when they come from the marketplace, they do not eat unless they wash. And there are many other traditions that they observe, such as the washing of cups and pots and copper vessels and dining couches. And the Pharisees and the scribes asked them, Why do your disciples not walk according to the tradition of the elders, but eat? with defiled hands. So the tradition is violated, but let's look a little bit at the keepers of tradition. The keepers of tradition, the Pharisees and the Sadducees. Now the Pharisees, their name literally means the separated ones, for they are strict, conservative, and they are exact in their exposition and living out the rules and the guidelines of the written Torah, the first five books of the Old Testament, the books of Moses. Pharisees were Jews who fought Hellenization. Now, Hellenization is where the Greeks had come in centuries before and had tried to convert all the Jews to the Greek culture. And some of the Jews said, no, we're purists, we're holding on to the Jewish culture. And that was the Pharisees who were born out of that. And some of them did not hold on to that. They were Hellenized, Greek eyes, as I like to say, and they were more toward the side of the Sadducees. But they were so passionate about following the right way, not to go the Greek way, they also had the written Torah and the oral Torah. And the oral Torah was really their interpretations of what Moses had said back in the Pentateuch. But, and the oral Torah became part of the Mishnah and the Talmud as well. And, and the objections that they previously raised are always connected to their oral Torah, what they have come up with as their understanding of what Moses wrote. For example, in Mark 2, the Pharisees objected to Jesus eating with sinners because no religious leader would eat with the bad people, the tax collectors and the sinners. It was unclean. Jesus was contaminating himself. A few verses later in Mark 2, the Pharisees object to the violation of the Sabbath in two different ways. One, the disciples are going around 
collecting food to eat out in the grain fields. And they said, you can't work on the Sabbath. That's work. You can't do that. And then Jesus healed somebody in the synagogue on the Sabbath. No, you can't work, it says. And this is what our work means. You can't do this, 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 and this. And that was based off the oral Torah, off of Moses' law. But they were more concerned about their interpretations to preserve Jewish culture than actually what the Bible said. Then you have the scribes here. The scribes, they were originally skilled writers, oddly enough, to transcribe documents, legal documents, records for kings and whatnot. But their role adjusted in the Babylonian captivity, and they then became intentional about preserving the Mosaic Law. Through copying the law again and again and again, they interpreted the law, and they taught the law. You probably know one of the most well-known scribes in all the Bible. He was a good one. It was Ezra. Critically, then, the work of the scribes became the basis of the rabbinic Judaism. So while the Pharisees are pontificating with oral traditions, the scribes were writing stuff down, and the two were working together. And actually, a lot of times, the scribes were a part of the Pharisees themselves. It could be both. But both of these groups loved the strict interpretation of the law and the oral tradition that went with it. They were trying to preserve tradition. The scribes have been around before as well. You go back to Mark 2 as well, and you will see there, they're the ones objecting to the guy that goes through the roof, the paralytic guy. They're the objecting to the fact that Jesus forgave sins, because who on earth can forgive sins that for God alone? They also objected to Jesus eating with sinners and the tax collectors. You can't eat with unclean people. And the scribes from Jerusalem were the ones that accused Jesus of casting out demons by the power of Belzebub. So these two groups together now, they've been working kind of independently, but these scribes come up to Galilee from Jerusalem, and the Pharisees and the scribes get together and say, we've got to get after this guy. He's destroying the traditions of our Jewish culture. And that is exactly the setting right here that we have in this text of Mark 7. But what's the violation? The observed violation is eating with unwashed hands. Now, I know there's a whole lot of children out here watching, and they're saying, what? I do that all the time. I don't wash my hands. I just eat food. What's the big deal? And the Pharisees and scribes are making a big deal out of this. The adults are thinking, I didn't know Scripture was talking to us about the coronavirus, that we need to be washing our hands. Well, if you come to that understanding, it actually has nothing to do with germs, nothing to do with dirt. Mark explains what is actually going on, and you can see in your Bible, it's in parentheses. We, like the original Gentile audience, don't really grasp what is happening here. We're not Jews. We don't understand the issue. So he explains it. And he says, verse 3, Pharisees and all the Jews do not eat unless they wash their hands properly. And this is kind of a ceremonial thing. It's nothing to do, again, like with dirt or germs. Now, he does say all Jews, but it's kind of the expectation that all Jews follow this. All Jews don't really follow this. The Pharisees wanted them all to, and Mark wrote as if they should be doing it. But we just had the story back last chapter, the feeding of the 5,000 men and all the women and children. How many of them do you think washed their hands before eating? In any sense? Well, obviously, there's no water, so they couldn't do that. And it doesn't seem there is any objection. There's a lot of Jews that probably aren't worried about this. Now, your text here says, unless they wash their hands properly. Well, in the original, it says, with a fist. And that really just tells you that they worked hard. In fact, the water had to be poured at least up to the wrist to count as a ceremonial washing. So if it didn't get all the way to the wrist, you were not clean. And so that was pretty extensive. And again, we might have to follow the same rules literally today just for the coronavirus. And, you know, every bathroom you go in, it's like, you must wash your hands for 20 seconds and do this and this and this and this and all kinds of stuff to make sure your hands are clean. So you get the idea. Very, very careful. But where did they come up with this? And where in the Bible does it say, thou shalt wash thy hands before thy eatest thy food? Well, that's part of the issue, is you don't really find it anywhere. 
But what the Pharisees have done and the scribes have done is they've kind of taken some verse or law back in Moses and have expanded it and extrapolated it up to here, which has nothing to do with the original, which is washing the hands for all people. Now, in Exodus 30, 19, in Exodus 40, 12, in the written Torah, the Pentateuch, the first five books, it says that priests actually had to wash their hands. Before they could come in, they had to wash their hands, the bronze labor, before they could offer the sacrifices. So ceremoniously, they are supposed to be clean. The Pharisees then said, you know what, not only do priests need to be clean, but Jews need to be clean. Because, you know, Jews are con in contact with Gentiles and unclean people, and so they actually also need to do this as well. The goal is holiness. So they figured if they did all this washing ritual, that the, if the external was clean, the hands and even the whole body, that they would be considered holy in the presence of God or to be able to eat their kosher food. But it's all oral tradition. You can see how it started in Scripture and just kind of bubbled up to some other rule. And so many of the laws and rules back then were like that. But it says here even, it adds to it. Mark just keeps talking and talking. These Jews, they have so many traditions. When they come home from the marketplace, they do not eat unless they wash. So this is interesting. So when you're going out shopping, again, you feel like you're in the coronavirus with this. You go out, you go on the Winco, you go to Safeway, Fred Meyer, you have to come home, wash all your food, wash everything. Well, why did they do it? They might have come in contact with an unclean Gentile. And so you got to wash everything. Now, again, we're not doing it for that reason. We have our own reasons why uh, we're obligated to wash our food here. What's really interesting here is the word for wash changes in Greek. And it's a word you know. It's the word baptizo. Baptizo. And, of course, that's where we get baptized or baptism from, which suggests that even this level of washing might be even greater. It's more than just a hand, so a little bit of washing of the hands ceremoniously, but it might be some kind of even whole body ritual. You've been contaminated by the Gentiles. And some of you have even seen the videos online where that lady comes home with all her grocery shopping and whatnot, and they take the groceries from her and just holds her off. Maybe that's kind of what they were thinking there, I don't know. But it's an idea that the body is unclean. And not only a person, but it says cups, plates, cup vessels, dining couches, all this stuff. You gotta just clean everything. Because it might have been contaminated by some way of other people. Now we're gonna get into this next week about the unclean, clean stuff. We're not gonna go all the way to the end. But Mark is actually building a case here for why we can eat all foods now and Gentiles are actually going to be part of the people of God as well. And that's where he's establishing that foundation. But we're not going to get there this week. We're going to stick with the whole tradition thing. Garland says, The law has created an illusion of ordered cosmos. So instead of all this chaos here, there are correctly, carefully erected boundaries that kept every person and everything in its proper place. And all these distinctions became important for conserving the distinctive nature of Judaism to prevent it from being mongrelized. By making such things critical, they could enforce group identity and increase devotion to the law. And that was the purpose of these traditions, to keep everyone in line. But appearing to be for holiness, the tradition actually became a control feature for the religious leaders to preserve identity. And in the end, God was left out of the picture. And the leaders asked her at the end of verse 5, why do your disciples not walk according to the tradition of the elders? These disciples, they weren't washing their hands. They weren't doing the ceremony, the ritual, that they were expected to do by the religious leaders. And Grasnick suggests that they would have thought that the disciples' failure to do this actually was reflective of something wrong internally a deeper problem. But the big picture here is scripture is not the basis of their accusation. You know, I was thinking on this as well. Woe to the one who ever violates a tradition, hey? An unwritten rule, a protocol, a custom, or anyone that would get rid of a sacred cow. 
Oh, how dare you cross that line? And some of you probably have embarrassing moments or horror stories of actually violating a tradition, violating something that was unknown to you. And you know, I was thinking to myself, we have this problem in churches, don't we? As you look back through the history of Christianity, conflict has arisen, arisen much because of tradition. There is controversies over pews versus chairs, hymns versus choruses, what color the carpet, what color the walls, organs versus modern instruments, church dress codes, how much hair can you have on your face for those of you that came out of the 70s. But you know what's interesting? The pendulum always swings, doesn't it? You know, back in the day, organs were actually once destroyed by Puritans because they felt that those musical devices failed to cause piety. You know what Christians do today? Is, oh, we don't need the organ. It's so archaic. It doesn't help us. But let's move on. My, how times have changed. And church traditions, while intending to cause holiness, produce often just external conformity and then sometimes internal rebellion. It doesn't change the heart. The traditions are just external. Now, the beautiful part about our church is that it's really hard to identify a tradition of the elders here. We don't have certain things from the top down that says, Thou shalt follow. Now, that's not to say we're not ritualistic in our church. That's not to say we don't hold on to certain things. I mean, you know, you know, for example, the order of service every Sunday. Have you always noticed it's like almost identical? To, uh, every single week you have the opening song. And then you have the opening prayer. Then maybe two or three songs, offering time, song or two, um, the, the message, and then a the closing song. Every week. Oh, man. You know, I, I make it real uncomfortable if we flip that around and I started preaching at the top, oh, you can't do that. You're violating tradition. You don't have any scriptural support for what order we should be doing. You know, here's another one. Assigned seating. For those of you who are not here, it's hilarious right now. Because even though there's almost nobody in this congregation, the people that are here are still sitting in their assigned seats. All a handful of them. Oh, to the rebel who sits in my pew. And I've heard stories in this church. And people, uh, we'll just stop right there, of people that violate the, the pew that's theirs. We always have to have the Roberts Rules of Orders for a business meeting. Now, that's not a bad thing. That's a tradition we have, and that's a good way to have order. But what if we did it differently? Oh, we might be in trouble. And many traditions, I think, are going to be uh, tested in this virtual age of doing church. You might have several other traditions that a church has that I haven't lifted, listed here, and I'm sure my phone is going to blow up later with all the text. But I believe that the lack of rigid rituals that we have in this church is due to really the work that Pastor Bob has done in this church. Because he kept progressing past the traditions. He kept moving forward and understanding that Scripture is a better foundation. And anything that was an issue... Pastor Bob would take the church, especially the leadership, back to the Bible, and that would develop a solid foundation. But even as we look at our church, or our families, or maybe workplace, are there traditions that may be governing what we do in a wrong way? Are there things that are causing us, or traditions, or rituals that are causing us to do things we shouldn't be doing, and actually detract from our focus of God? And in his response to these scribes and Pharisees, Jesus gives two errors that can be instructive for us to see if tradition is crossing a critical line. So let's move on from tradition violation to tradition elimination. And we'll start in verse 6. Mark 7, verse 6. And Jesus said to them, Well, did Isaiah prophesy of you, hypocrites, as it is written, this people honors me with their lips, but their heart is far from me. In vain do they worship me, teaching as doctrines the commandments of men. You leave the commandment of God and hold to the tradition of men. And he said to them, You have a fine way of rejecting the commandment of God in order to establish your tradition. For Moses said, Honor your father and your mother. 
And whoever reviles father or mother must surely die. But if you say uh, that the man, but you say, if a man tells his father or mother, whatever you would have gained from me is Corbin, that is given to God, then you no longer permit him to do anything for his father or mother. Thus making void the word of God by your tradition that you have handed down. And many such things you do. The first area that you see that Jesus addresses in regards to their tradition is when tradition negates worship. We have a problem. And that's when the tradition needs eliminated. So if there's any tradition that gets in the way of proper worship of God, you need to evaluate it to eliminate it. And he starts out the, the gate here pretty strong. Well, rightly did Isaiah prophesy about you, hypocrites. And he does. This comes back in Isaiah 29, 13. And that's the foundation for this argument. But notice where Jesus goes to. The Pharisees and scribes use what? Their oral tradition. What does Jesus use for the basis of his argument? Scripture. The word of God. Notice the difference here. And he calls them hypocrites. Pretenders. For they're, they're pretending to be something that they're not. They're pretending to be, or they have the appearance to be, holy. But in reality, they're whitewashed sepulchers. And how are these religious leaders? Pretenders. Well, as Isaiah says, this people honors me with their lips, but their heart is far from me. All oh, these religious leaders might sound amazing with their lips. They're the ones praying on the street corners and fasting and showing it on their face. They have all these wonderful guidelines for worship that they follow perfectly, and people think they're really holy. Oh, and we need to follow them just like those people. But while they come across pious and godly on the outside, they're full of dead bones on the inside. They really aren't concerned about God's honor and glory with the tradition, although that may come out with their lips, but they're more concerned about Jewish identity, and I think also job security. As Frank says, scribal religion is more concerned with external correctness then with the fundamental attitudes and relationship with God on the inside. He continues, In vain do they worship me, teaching his doctrines the commandments of men. Well, that helps to know the original Isaiah passage here. It's quoted from the Septuagint, but I went back to Isaiah and actually translated it there, and it's a terrible arrangement for English. But the idea is the fearing of me being learned is by the commandment of men. The fear of God is being learned by traditions. So these religious leaders have created, seen scripture, and then they've created all these rules and parameters and rituals, but these people are following this instead of this, and that's how they think they're worshiping God. Oh, is that ever dangerous? You can get into these rituals of certain things you do as a church, as a person, and think that you're worshiping God, and in the end, you're not. And that is scary. And that's why I think Jesus adds to this verse, which is not in Isaiah. Of course, Jesus can add to Scripture. He puts the two words, in vain. The worship is meaningless. There's no purpose. It's futile. And so these people have created this thing, finite men have created this tradition to worship God, but how in the world can a finite person correctly determine how to worship an infinite God? They have gotten so far from Scripture, the worship is vain. When I came on staff here at this church, I greatly appreciated Sally Rothwell's uh, work in the worship team because she used songs with solid lyrics and she steered away from the performance mentality. I actually got to talk to her on the phone yesterday, and we talked about this a little bit. But the worship that she designed wasn't stuck in the past, in the 50s and the 40s, the way we've always done it, but it also the way she designed it wasn't just in the fads of the present and all the coolness and the showiness of the present. She understood the bigger picture. Now, some of you watching may think that we're kind of stuck back a little bit more on the traditional music. But I've told people for decades when I select music, it has nothing to do with the song selection or the style as much as the theme of the message. And it's interesting how different messages 
attract different songs and different genres. I do also take into account the strengths and abilities of the worship team. Some of them can and can't do certain things. It brings out different angles of worship. But we're, our goal is not to get stuck in some traditional thing, the way we've always done it, and to get there and look like we're a church back in the 50s and the 60s. God allows people to write new and great music. And another thing that we've done at this church to kind of steer away from tradition, and I know some of you object to it, and I still hear a comment here and there, but it's the elimination of that greeting time that we had. Now, I know some of you have absolutely loved that, but it was prevented actually for this very reason, because it interrupted our worship of God. We had the opening song where, for example, we might have seen El Shaddai, and then we have a prayer, and our minds and our hearts are focusing on God, and then suddenly we jump out of our pews for five minutes and we greet each other. Maybe with a holy kiss or whatnot, but we aren't talking much about God in that time. So we sidetrack our focus on the worship of God. So that was one of the reasons why we decided to allow people to engage with each other the other 166 hours a week in fellowship time and not worry about that during the middle of the service. But let me ask us. Are there ways that we honor God with our lips, but our heart is far from God? You sang several songs a few minutes ago. Do you remember what words you sang? Were those words truly an expression of the heart, or they were just kind of words rolling off the lips, and you can't even remember what you sang? So that's the danger even you and I can get in. It becomes a ritual. We can either be passionate and zealous, but... Is it really an expression of our heart? Hopefully this virus crisis has even caused you to consider the value of attending church on Sunday. Maybe you just kind of did it before. It was an obligation. It's a ritual. You know, good Baptists go to church. But now that church attendance is on a hiatus, you miss that community, that sweet fellowship, that connecting with your brothers and sisters in Christ. Maybe now you realize it's not just a tradition that we just get up on Sunday mornings and we force everybody in the car and get to church, but it's something that is actually an act of worship. And hopefully this absence will make your heart grow fonder for those times of worship that we'll have together again, once again in the future as a body. I anticipate when we all get back together that first Sunday, the singing will raise the roof up of this church and praise for God for what he's done, brought us through this time together, and all that he's done even through the trial. I even wonder about some of the traditional holidays that kind of get mixed up in the church, for example. You know, one of the best silver linings of this virus crisis was this holiday that we just left. Did you notice it? Oh, the traditions that people have, their Easter egg hunts, and their chocolate baskets, and, and our Easter bag, baskets with chocolate, and all this stuff. You know, this year, maybe I just avoided the stores more than usual, but I felt like this was the first season where I was completely, really, truly focused in my world on the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ, because we, we didn't have the opportunity as well to celebrate all these other traditions that we had on Easter. I even wonder at Christmas if sometimes we get lost in the season. All oh, the beautiful decorations, the lights, the presents, and everything else. Oh, and then there's Jesus. Oh, I wonder what would happen if, if we cut back on some of the decorations at home, maybe at church. Maybe Jesus would get back into the primary, primary position instead of being a sideline. And see, a lot of these issues that we have where tradition kind of creeps in and it can detract from our worship of God. So that's where we have to look at what we do as a church, as a family, even around our workplace and our community. Are some of these traditions squeezing out our worship of God? And then he has the other area as well. When tradition negates worship, but eliminate when tradition nullifies. And that's supposed to be the word of God, I think, there nullifies scripture. So that's an error on the slide there. I apologize for that. Eliminate when tradition nullifies scripture. Nullifies scripture. What happens here is, and Jesus says it very succinctly, you leave the commandment of God and hold to the tradition of men. 
You read the commandment of God for the tradition of men. Now look at that. And, and what happens here, and you can see word pairs. You weave and you hold. It's for the, you've left the commandment to hold on to the tradition. You leave the commandment of God to hold on to the tradition of man. Very clear focus here. The opposites. And, and notice Jesus doesn't even regard their oral tradition here as the tradition of the elders. The Pharisees and the scribes said, oh, you're ignoring the tradition of elders. What does Jesus call it? Tradition of man. So he's downgraded the elevation of their holy, pious thinking. It's just man's word. And the first area that this statement can be applied to, the commandment of God, has been replaced by the tradition of man, is really that whole area of worship. Because instead of being grounded in the word of God for the worship and obedience, the religious leaders use their own pontifications on what the worship shall be. Teaching doctrines, as it's called here, the commandments of men, as the commandments of men. And so in the end, the people actually aren't worshiping God because they're listening to the traditions of men, not scripture. We've already highlighted that as well. An infinite God has to provide guidelines in the word of God so that we can truly worship the person of God. Scripture is absolutely necessary to right worship of God. And this is important because I hear people that don't have time to read the Word of God. They might have time to pray. They don't have time to listen to the Word of God on their cell phones or radios or whatever devices. And they, and they feel like that's enough to worship God. But friends, if you aren't studying the Bible regularly, if you aren't taking the time to dig into it, you're going to have a shallow, at best, a shallow, faulty worship of God. But at worst, you're going to be conjuring up worship of some other God who isn't even the God of Scripture. It's fundamental that you get into the Word of God. And you come across those people out there, yeah, I don't come to church, I just go out in nature, and I worship God in nature. Which God? Because you're not going to be able to figure out a whole lot from God out in nature. I mean, Romans 1, 20 does say that you can see His divine nature, and that he's eternal, well, that's the only going to carry you so far in worship. It reveals that you're a sinner, and that's it. One cannot worship God without learning about him. The whole purpose of the Word of God is to reveal who God is, and how to worship him, and how to be in a right, right relationship with him. So if you don't read the Word of God, your worship is shallow. So I would challenge you that if you have not been active in the Word of God, get started. I know it's not the first of the year, but this would be a good time to get started with a Bible reading plan. I've had several of them come across my computer, my plate recently. If you want one of those, just ask. I will give them to you. But worship starts by knowing the God in His Word and His expectations of worship. There's no other way that you can worship God. So if any of your traditions are dragging you away from Scripture, then you know your worship is going to fall as well. And Jesus gives another way tradition has superseded God. He gives a specific command here, and this is where tradition actually trumps Scripture, uh, the, the commandment, the fifth commandment. And to introduce even this, he says in verse 9, he says to them, you have a fine way of rejecting the commandment of God in order to establish your tradition. Now, notice, again, the digression that has gone on here. They think it's the tradition of the elders. In verse 8, what does Jesus call it? Tradition of men. In verse 9, what does he call it? Your tradition. It's getting worse and worse and worse, the evaluation of the tradition. He's downgrading it. And furthermore, he's become increasingly harsh toward their view of their uh, traditions here. In verse 8, he says, you leave the commandment of God. What does he say in verse 9? You reject the commandment of God. So uh, leaving is just this kind of casual thing. Okay, we're done with that. But then a rejection is a much stronger word. So we don't even want that. Ours is better than the command of God. And so that's what he's accusing them of doing, is establishing their tradition above Scripture. Moses said what? Honor your father and your mother. 
Whoever reviles father or mother must surely die. Let's pull out Exodus 20 and Exodus 21, as you know. And it's interesting. It's, it's coming from their beloved forefather. They loved Moses too much because they actually did not see Jesus because they did not understand what Moses was writing about. So I thought Moses and Abraham, those were the righteous people, not Jesus. But again, what does Jesus do? To continue building his argument, he uses scripture. Not the foundations of men. Not the tradition of elders, like the religious leaders do. So Moses said, from scripture, God's word, this is the command. Honor your father and mother, or die reviling. But these people here say what? If a man tells his father and mother, whatever you would gain from me is Corbin, that is given to God, then you no longer permit him to do anything for this father or mother. Now, what had happened here, this is a kind of a confusing passage, but their traditions had actually created a loophole in the fifth commandment. Always be aware of traditions creating loopholes in Scripture. Many a son in that day would have needy parents. In fact, it was expected that, or desired to have a son. If you didn't have a son, you might be in trouble taking, being taken care of if you got old. Uh, there's many biblical examples, but probably the most prominent one is the state of Naomi. She called herself bitter. She has no future. She's as good as dad because all she has left is daughter-in-law. So her husband, Elimelech, is dead, and her two sons have died. And so she needs a son to survive. And so it's expected that some kinsman redeemer would come in and take care of them. But in this case here, you've got a guy, and this happened a lot of times, where you have a son that did not really want to part with his possessions to take care of his family. He enjoyed his possessions. And, and, and he didn't want to take away from the building of his kingdom, as it were, to be able to support his parents. So the solution would be, I'm going to declare all my possession gone. And that's what happens. They would put the special vow on it called Corbin. And if the son declared his property Corbin to his parents, according to Lane, he promised it actually not to the temple, nor prohibited its use for itself. But he simply excluded his parents from access to the assets. Regardless of this, Corbin was a dedicatory formula used in setting aside property and it barred the parents from gaining profit from it. What's fascinating is it only expressed an intention to give the property to God. And you would not actually have to give it to God at that moment. So you say, hey, I've got this nice car. My parents could do this. But I, I, I like to keep that car. I don't want to have to sell it. Give it to my mom and dad. I like it. I want it. She said, all right, this car, it's gone. The parents had no access to it. But the guy would not have to actually give up that car. He, he would intend to give it up for the work of God. Now what happens, though, is in this scenario, that should the shot son regret his actions, like, oh, you know what, I should actually be honoring my parents here, and to alleviate this harsh vow, which it was a vow, then he would go to the scribes and say, hey, look, uh, can I walk that back? I didn't really mean it. Um, I need to honor my parents. The scribes would say, actually, no, you can't do it. You vow, it says in the Bible, that in Numbers 30, that if you make a vow, you must keep the vow, and it must be honored. So the parents were stuck, and the son couldn't help his parents. And this was done, there was strictly a religious establishment had this tradition, that if you call something important, give it to God, it's permanent. It cannot be walked back. And what they've done then has created a loophole where another scripture can be superseded or placed on top of another scripture. Now, what does Jesus say? And there, therefore, you've made void the word of God by your tradition that you've handed down. So you've nullified one of the top ten commandments by this little other rule here, and you've invalidated it. The religious leaders had actually repealed or annulled the fifth commandment by their traditions. And that was only one of the traditions superseded by scripture that the Jews did, according to Jesus. Many other such things that you do. 
So when tradition trumps scripture, or actually when you're using a piece of scripture to manipulate another scripture, that happens too, eh? Well, it says here the God will do this. Well, all right, but you still got this. And you have to work them together. Traditions violate scripture, then you have a problem. Well, and I've got several things that came to mind on this as well. Baptists traditionally are known more for what they're against than what they're for. Have you ever noticed that? We're so separatist in what we do, especially historically. Wilbur told me this week, in fact, that in the old days, decades and decades ago, J. Vernon McGee would not have been allowed to speak in this church. I couldn't believe it. J. Vernon McGee, I grew up listening to that guy on the radio, saw a preacher of the word. But you know what? He was a Baptist. Therefore, he could not speak in a Baptist church. Oh, man. So this tradition of Baptist overshadow the prayer that Jesus prayed for unity. That's a brother in Christ and a great brother in Christ preaching the truth of the word of God. Yeah, he might be Presbyterian and have a couple of things a little off base, but it even sounded like he might have been a dispensationalist of all things. But Baptist tradition trumped scripture. My wife and I were talking this week about another American tradition the churches have. You know, what's the next thing and the first thing you do when your church gets bigger and bigger and bigger? You know, 80 people, 100 people, 120 people, suddenly we got 200 people coming here to our church. You know what you do automatically? You build a new church building, don't you? So we go out there and, and build our back 40 out there. Huge new edifice. Oh, that God's working, God's being glorified, he's growing our church. What if that's not the best tradition to follow? You know, so many of the churches that Heidi and I looked at that have done this, that have gone to a new beautiful building, they actually have declined, either spiritually or numerically or both. And so many of them become chained to debt, and the finances then become the focus as they're trying to pay off this huge, huge new building. But what if we instead decided, hey, instead of building a new church, let's see if we can find creative ways to get rid of people in the church, like plant new churches. Or, or you know, my vision here is maybe we should be seeking to train up people for ministry, for the mission field, so we don't get too big here. After all, what does Matthew 28, 19 say? We're supposed to go and make disciples. Not come and have a huge, ginormous church. So what would, what would happen if our church grew? Just a thought. Maybe we would find other ways more scriptural than building this huge megachurch. Now, I'm not against megachurches. There's a great one out there. But that's the tension that we have. We have to look at these traditions. Have they become too traditional? And do we have to eliminate them? And, uh, and then according to this text, is we need to carefully evaluate tradition when it's starting to impinge on our ability to worship God. And we need to look at traditions when it is becoming a problem with scriptures, eliminating when tradition nullifies scriptures. And so we come to the challenge of Tevier. You know who he is, right? He's that guy still there on the roof. Tradition, tradition. <laughs> Tradition, and the whole movie is about what do I do? He's a Jew. Do I keep the old ways that we've always done, or do we move on, become more contemporary? And so the whole movie is that struggle, fiddler on the roof. So let me ask you: Do you hold on to tradition? Is it good? Is it helpful? Or is it hurtful? And what's the foundation of that tradition? Does it need altered? Does it need scrapped? So the challenge here after today is I think we need to evaluate our traditions in our family, our personal lives, our church even as well. We might see some more things that we need to work on. But we need to look at whatever these rituals are to see if they interfere with our worship of God or the word of God. And for the keepers of tradition, now you know who you are, because I'm borderline one of them, just like the Pharisees and the, and the scribes. These are the ones who say, we must keep the scripture. You know, so often they get kind of militant or angry if somebody suggests we change. But let me ask you this, the keepers of the tradition, is it about your security, your significance, or is it about the spiritual standing of the people? 
Is it about your selfish preferences or spiritual purity? So you have to look at these things. Why do I want to keep so tight hold on these things? Is it actually good, beneficial, or is it detrimental to where me and my family could grow? And for those of you who have traditions, all our circles, whatever they are, it's family, it's work, or maybe even school traditions, personal traditions, rituals, customs, sacred trials. I would challenge you to evaluate them, work through them. Are your traditions helping you worship God? Or is it merely just an external show of piousness in Christianity? Are there any habits or rituals that you have that are actually violating scripture and that you need to eliminate them? My challenge this morning, let us stand alone on the word of God to establish or to eliminate our traditions. Let's pray this morning. Father, I thank you again for this opportunity and time that we have to look at traditions. And Lord, as we go through this week now, we're going to look at our lives and your Holy Spirit's going to prick our conscience and and to kind of show us areas that kind of might be traditions. Well, we've always done it that way. We have to do this, because that's what our family should do. So many of those traditions are actually not good. They're legalistic, fundamentalistic, and so many of these areas need to change. And we pray this week that you would help us to eliminate traditions that get in the way, particularly of the worship of God and the Word of God. And that we might be a people that are well grounded on the Word of God. Thank you again for this time to Mark. In Jesus' name, amen. As the worship team comes forward this morning, we're going to sing about the Word of God. Every promise of your Word. And I, again, this is an instructive song uh, for the line of the message as well. But I think it's a good song for us to continue thinking through this time of different trials and different challenges that we have as a church. So let's sing together this song, Every Promise. Thank you. 
Thank you again for being with us this morning. We pray that you would have a wonderful week together. God bless you.